turn video off or does that matter now, uh, you know, or not? Are we, are we good? Um, folks are muted, um, but they can, I think they can leave their video on okay. if they want, you know, yep. like to see people's faces. I know we're coming out of the pandemic, but still nice to see people's faces. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Why don't we go ahead and get started, everyone? So thank you to everyone who's joined us. Um, so we're going to be talking about cicadas and fishing um, and all that kind of jazz. Um, so my name is Emily Silence. I work for Potomac Riverkeeper Network. So we are an organization that works to safeguard the Potomac and Shenandoah rivers. Um, so I'm going to kind of let Mark, our Shenandoah Riverkeeper, introduce our panelists. Um, but like I said, everyone is muted for right now. So you can feel free to uh, type questions in the chat box, um, but we will answer them kind of at the end of everything, just so we can let all of our wonderful panelists get through, uh, get through their discussions. So without further ado, Mark, if you want to kick us off. Great. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, thank you all for coming to this uh, Brood X. It's a once every 17 years. I'm excited about it. Gonna sort of nerd out on things. Um, I see a lot of familiar faces and a lot of familiar names. Um, um, so just a little bit of some uh, odds and ends and logistical announcements. We have the best cold beer in the refrigerator just right around the corner, it's your favorite kind. And we got chips around the corner too and uh, the bathrooms are just down the hall. Um, uh, what else? Oh, I've got my favorite friend here, Sam Adams. He made it, which is good. So. Um, Anyway, this, this panel, we have uh, John Cooley, we have uh, Grizzly from District Angling, we have Butch Murphy, and we have William Horezniak. And, and right now, I want to introduce John Cooley. Um, John is up at the University of Connecticut, and he's in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. And, um, and I, before I started this whole thing and trying to pull this panel together, I wanted to get somebody that was very knowledgeable on Brood X. And um, I was familiar with, uh, there's a webpage out there, Cicada Mania. And so I called uh, Dan Mozgai, and I hope I'm pronouncing Dan's name correctly. And, and I was talking to Dan, I'm like, hey, would you like to be, to be on this panel? And he's like, oh no, you don't want me. The guy that you want is John Cooley, he's the shit. And I'm like, really? And he's like, oh yeah, he knows everything there is to know about Brood X and he helps out on the page and everything. And so he's the guy. And so I called up and spoke with John and John was kind enough to come out and agree to, um, to enlighten us a little bit about uh, Brood X. And so I'm just very happy to introduce uh, John to the group. And John, thank you very much. And the floor is yours. Thank you. Now there's a little bit of a fish story aspect to that. I, I don't know everything about periodical cicadas, but what I want to do here tonight is uh, just give you a little bit of an introduction because you're about to experience a wild ride. And if you weren't there 17 years ago, or you haven't experienced this, uh, hold on to your seat. This is going to be a little bit different from what you're probably used to. So uh, without getting too complicated here, um, let's get started. I'm just going to give you a little bit of a background uh, information about periodical cicadas. And then I'm going to step back and, and eventually we'll deal with, with uh, questions and comments and all that. It is in fact spring, uh, even though it doesn't look like it and even though it doesn't feel like it, it's spring uh, and spring is full of change. Biologists love spring because things are changing over. Some things that we haven't seen for a while are coming out uh, and it's, a, it's an exciting time. One of the things that comes out starting in the spring are singing insects. So it's been pretty quiet. Uh, the birds came back, we heard them, but now we're gonna start to, to hear singing insects in our environment. And the singing insects are things like crickets and katydids, grasshoppers, they sing too. Uh, and other ones are cicadas. Uh, so the cicadas come in a lot of varieties. There are probably about 200 species here in North America. Cicadas are loud. Uh, they typically sing during the day and they make their sound using these organs on the abdomen called timbals. Only males have these organs. So when you hear them out there, you're only hearing half the population because the females don't make loud sounds. They can make sounds using their wings, but they don't have these timbals. If you think about the way a year progresses, the first things that come out are spring crickets, and so you'll start to hear those in May and June. 
in a typical year. The cicadas come online in July. You get uh, tree crickets. They're showing up in July and August. Katydids show up in August. And then the fall crickets show up in September and October. But sometimes, and in some places, there's something else that shows up. And that's periodical cicadas. They're unusual in that they are spring cicadas. There aren't very many spring cicadas in North America. And when they come out, you can't miss them. So there's a periodical cicada. This one actually happens to be from Brood 10 in 2004. So that picture is 17 years old. A lot of people, when you read the popular articles or whatever in the newspapers, they say, oh, the cicadas are coming, the cicadas are coming. In fact, they've always been there. And they're there all the time if you're in a place that has cicadas. They just live underground for most of their lives. They go through five stages. Uh, the first instar is this little tiny hatchling. It's about the size of a grain of rice. Uh, they molt and you get a second instar, third instar, fourth, and then fifth. Fifth instars are the ones that construct holes and you should start seeing holes in your area right now if you've got periodical cicadas. And they're the ones that come out and molt into the adult form. So there is a periodical cicada living underground in its chamber. And they, people ask, you know, what do they do for 17 years? They're just feeding and they're just doing everything fairly slowly. They're not sleeping, they're not resting, they're not in some kind of hibernation. They're just doing their thing underground. When it's time, that fifth instar cicada comes out of the ground and tries to find a place to molt. They can be really picky about that. So they'll wander around a little bit. They've got to avoid falling off during this process. It's a very delicate process, uh, molting. And when they find just the right spot, then they undergo molting. And this is what a molting cicada looks like. They're very pale when they split the skin and crawl out. And this whole process takes about an hour. This is one that's getting towards the end of the process. It's just about ready to fold its wings up and then it's gonna walk off into the vegetation. Once they finish this process, they just walk away and then hang out for about a week. It's unusual among cicadas. Uh, many of them, they just get right into their activity and start doing things like calling and flying and all that, but not the periodical cicadas. They crawl off and spend a week more maturing somewhere in the vegetation. And then when they're ready to go, they form these large choruses and they are loud and they are active. The cicadas in these choruses are flying around and singing. There's a long history of scientific study of periodical cicadas. Uh, it's really got going in the 19th century. And what we know from that work and what was known early on is that the periodical cicadas are divided up into broods. Now, broods are not exactly something that has a biological definition. Now, what is a brood? It's not a species. It's not a population. It's a collection of species that just happen to emerge on the same schedule. Right now, there are 12 broods of 17-year cicadas and three broods of 13-year cicadas. And there have been some extinctions. So uh, there was a brood right here in Connecticut that went extinct in 1954. And there was a brood down in the Apalachicola Valley in Florida that went extinct sometime in the late 19th century. This is the year of brood 10. And so these dark marks right here are where you can expect to see cicadas this time around. There is a little disjunct out on Long Island. I've been getting a lot of news reports, people like, oh, they're coming to Manhattan. No, they're not. Today's uh, wrong news report of the day was, oh, they're coming to Chicago. No, they're not. Brood 10 really has these, these three major areas. There's this Eastern part that's just the top part of Virginia, Delaware, New Jersey, Maryland, a little bit of West Virginia and up into Pennsylvania and that little piece on Long Island. There's a big central portion here in Eastern Illinois, Indiana, even into Kentucky, Ohio and Michigan. Then there's this southern bit that goes in Tennessee and down into Georgia and a little bit over in North Carolina. And that's brood 10. Periodical cicadas have a really complicated set of species. There are two life cycles, 13 and 17 years, and there are three species groups. You can't tell just by looking at a cicada what 
its life cycle is, but you can tell by looking at it what species group it belongs to because they're quite distinctive in morphology and coloration. They're also distinctive in their songs. So I, I am an acoustical biologist. I use insect songs uh, to study uh, their behavior. When we are looking at insect songs, we can look at them in two ways. We can look at oscillograms, which are a graph of sound energy or volume or intensity over time, and then spectrograms, which are pitch over time. And this really reads like musical notation. You can see, you can figure out what this sound is just by reading that. So we can look at pattern and pitch, and the insects are paying attention to pattern and pitch as well. The three species groups of periodical cicadas have three very different kinds of calls. The decim groups uh, of cicadas have these pure tone calls. Pure tone calls are unusual in cicadas. So it's a pure tone with a down slur, kind of a like that. The Cassini species have a series of ticks and then a frequency sweep. And the decula species have these sounds that are more complicated, hard to describe, but sounds like that. And you'll hear all three of those mixed into a chorus. The different uh, species can be, you know, sometimes one species is rare, sometimes one is really common, but you'll often find them all mixed in there. And it turns out that we're not going to get the next slide because it doesn't want to show it. There we go. We can do playback experiments with these cicadas. And this is an awful lot of fun to do. We can play recordings of the sounds and get them to respond. So we can play male recordings. And what we look for in these experiments is female responses. So males make loud sounds and females respond with little wing flicks. And those wing flicks are timed in response to the male calls. So male calling right here. And this just broad frequency sharp sound here is a female clicking her wings just like that at just the right time relative to the call. And that's how they exercise mate choice. Females do not wing flick to males that belong to the wrong species. So males are using those sounds to uh, broadcast the identity, what species they belong to, and females respond to them or not depending on what the males are saying. And lots of cicadas use wing flick sounds. Um, one of the weirder and more surreal things that has come out of the research on periodical cicadas is that uh, they get infected by a fungus and the fungus diseases hijacks their sexual signals. So it causes males to make female-like sounds as well as male-like sounds so that everybody wants to mate with them. And then when they try to do that, they get infected by the fungus. And this fungus turns them into zombies uh, and they run around dispersing more fungal spores. And you'll often see that. Uh, you will see that these uh, cicadas who have the fungus infections, the abdomen is broken off and uh, there's a white mass of material inside. The interesting thing, and I, this is not widely known, it hasn't made it out into the uh, popular press quite so much yet, but these uh, fungal spores contain the same substances that you find in magic mushrooms. And so they're incredibly distasteful uh, to vertebrates. So if vertebrates eat these, it's a bad thing for the vertebrate. And that would, I presume, apply to fish as well. If a fish eats one of these infected cicadas, that's not going to be a good day for that fish at all. My uh, role in this project is I run around doing rapid surveys. And so we actually do have a team on the ground in the DC and Alexandria area. It's, it's not me, but there is a team on the ground there and they're running around finding out where the cicadas are uh, and making maps that you can see on our website. And if you wanna know how our website works, this is what you get when you call up our website, which is cicadas.yukon.edu make that a little bigger. Uh, you can find out about the 2021 periodical cicada emergence here. So you click on that and you get everything you need to know about brood 10, uh, including a map. So uh, when we go and look at brood 10, we can see the great Eastern brood is what it's called. And the map 
there it is. That's the map and you can zoom right in. So if you wanna know if you have periodical cicadas in your neighborhood, well, we can just zoom right in here. We have a lot of records here from the DC area, a lot of records from Northern Virginia. You can just zoom right in, go into Alexandria. There, there, Loftridge Park. Right there, somebody had a record of periodical cicadas. Uh, and right in that little neighborhood. If you click on that, that was a record that was taken in 2004. Um, the other thing about this is you can view our progress. So this is what our team on the ground is generating. They've been down in uh, North Carolina. So this is near Nor Elkin, North Carolina, but we hope to fill this map up a little bit more. So just to zoom out, that's what we got going so far. The cold weather has slowed us down. And you can also see what's, uh, what people are reporting on Cicada Safari, which is the app. And so um, there is today's map from Cicada Safari. And I think we were talking before starting about how things are starting to pop around DC. And you can see the records here. They've got about 3,000 coming here from um, just northwest of DC. It is starting to pop in the area. The slow weather slows it down, but it's, it's on. And uh, that's really all I want to say about background of periodical cicadas. Uh, and I want to step back and hear what everybody else has to say. And then I'm happy to uh, answer questions. Great, John, thank you very much for that. That was really interesting. I know there's questions that are starting to pop in the chat, in the chat box that you might want to take a look at. Um, it, you know, I, people have lots and lots of, of questions. Um, you know, I, I know some of our folks have been talking about how much protein actually exists in the, in the cicada body. Is that what makes them so uh, delicious for fish and everything else? But um, we're not going to get into Q&A right now. I'm, I'm violating my own um, rule here. And uh, let me just introduce Grizzly. Uh, Grizzly, uh, David Lambert. Um, Grizzly has been a fixture in the Arlington area for uh, 20 some odd years in the, in the, in the fishing scene. Um, um, I've known Grizzly since my son was a little munchkin running around in Safeway throwing fruit and Grizzly spotted him and, and he's now 26 and out in California. So Grizzly's been around for a long time. Besides being an incredible uh, angler, he's also a world-class uh, photographer and a bamboo maker and um, just incredibly knowledgeable about bamboo and um, also is just very savvy about the whole fishing seen in the um, D, in the greater DC area. And so let me just at this point, just turn it over to Grizzly. Grizzly, thank you very much for coming. Thank you, Richie, um, District Angling. You guys put the word out and um, it exploded in the last couple of hours like the cicadas are doing right now. Right now. So thanks. <clears throat> well, thanks uh, for, for uh, being so kind. Um, yeah, I've actually uh, worked in a fly shop or tackle shop in this area since I was a teenager. Um, and the cicadas have always been a fascinating thing for all of us, particularly since I got into fly fishing. Unfortunately, I missed the first brood X because I was a kid down in Kentucky, but I uh, look forward to everyone in this area, including the ones up in PA. Um, what I like to do is something like in fly fishing in the older days, people would follow hatches north. And uh, the Hendricksons in particular, guys would start down in North Carolina and follow them all the way up into the Catskills. We can do that with the cicadas because of they're gonna start here because it's warmer and then get up into uh, Pennsylvania and over into Western Maryland. And um, uh, John, chime in on this if you want. What I found interesting is, uh, and I think William will uh, echo this too, is what's interesting is when you start looking at like Garrett County, they just get into the edge of Garrett and they stop. And I couldn't figure it out until I realized, oh, that's the Eastern Continental Divide. Yeah, there's a lot of singing insects that do that. That's a really great observation. There's a whole bunch of the katydids do that too, right along the crest of the Appalachians. There's a Northern type and a Southern type. You drive across the Appalachians at night, you'll hear when you switch. Interesting. Well, like I said, I, I, I find all of this nature stuff fascinating. I'm also a guy that's into orchids, uh, wild orchids and stuff like that.
but let, let's try to help the fishers out right now. Um, one of the things that we all need to do is actually find some areas that are worth fishing, but also find a little solitude because who doesn't like that with their fishing? On District Angling website, I did a how to find blue line streams and some of that information applies to this. Um, information can be gathered from fishermen to fishermen, uh, going to websites, going to great sites, like uh, I can't tell you how many times I've been to Cicada Mania. Um, but folks, what we need to do is just start looking at all sorts of information sources. And this is some stuff that's in that video um, I was just talking about, but as you're going up into PA, stop off at the rest stops. They have amazing guides to each region and how to find different fishing in each region. And they give these away for free. <laughs> so the Southeast and the South Central are what we wanna focus on for cicadas. And there's other wonderful handouts. Fly fishing, Garrett County. Um, also, whether you have the old versions of some of our best fly fishing books, um, hit the books and look at your map overlays on Cicada Mania because it's going to show you where you should be looking. And then, you know, I love the GPS stuff, but there's nothing like a good old classic map rolling down the window and listening for the cicadas. They're, they're really bad for letting you know where they're at. Um, for us locally here in the DC area, um, we have an amazing opportunity to fish for so many fish. Um, I know that uh, the carp has gotten more popular. We also have, and this is one that I'm really interested in, the snakeheads. They're living in three feet of water. Now, I don't know if anyone has ever caught a snakehead on a cicada. I want to be one of the first, <laughs> right? But what I think one of the great advantages of the cicada to us fly fishers in particular is that we can go to places that we normally wouldn't pay that much attention to, okay? Any piece of water is going to be at its best during this. It's going to bring up the most fish, the best fish. Um, and I want to just go over a couple of, of ones that I think some people may not look at enough. Um, of course, we all love the Potomac River, but right next door is the CNO Canal for 184 miles, right? Not all of us got water. I got to check and see where the water still is, but legendary carp fishing. And if we can match the blueberry with the cicada, that's like dinner and dessert. <laughs> so I, I want to go over a couple of places that I think people should look at. Um, Occoquan Reservoir. It's actually a really good bass fishery. Um, you can take a, a boat there up to a 10 horsepower, or you can just rent one of their rowboats, use your own pulling motor, whatever. And they have both uh, Fountainhead and Bull Run Marina. Um, you have the Occoquan River, and there's a regional park below the reservoir, but they actually now have a canoe kayak launch under the 123 bridge, it's open 24 hours a day. Okay, so that's an option. Uh, Pohig Bay, I think would be a good option. Just be careful if you cross the bay, it can be hard getting back with the, the wrong wind. My brother and his bass boat has re rescued many people. <laughs> so be careful of that in a canoe or a kayak. Um, now the VDGIF, which is actually now going by, where are they going by now? They changed their name, now they're going by the, uh, DWR um, has some places, uh, Burke Lake being one of them. And actually, uh, that's one of the best rated bass fisheries by the biologist in the state of Virginia. Um, you also want to start uh, look at other places like like Riddle. That's one out towards Warrington. It's a small, but it's very shallow in one end of it. And whatever swimming there, it's going to be eating the cicadas. Now let's just look at something even really even closer, let's look at Fairfax County Parks. You got Huntsman's Lake, you got Lake Mercer, you got Royal Lake, you got Wood Glen Lake. 
in Maryland, you've got uh, Piney Lake, you have Rocky Gorge Reservoir, Liberty Reservoir, Pretty Boy. And I just had a gentleman in here half an hour ago, hour ago, that was just bragging about how big the carp he was catching in all those Maryland reservoirs, like 20 pounders were, were getting common on cicadas 17 years ago. So, and uh, he's a guy that I trust. I'm, I'm, he said he did, he did it. Um, here's another place that we all need to start looking. And this is also in that other video that I did. So the GIS is the Geographic Information System. And it is every state that I know in fish has this system. Uh, Virginia, you got to go to www.dwrvirginia.gov slash GIS. You can do that with Virginia, Maryland, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. All the places we're looking at right now. And what's so cool about those systems, you can zoom in, you can zoom out, you can go across the whole state, put your cursor on a lot of the creeks and rivers. It'll tell you what species are in there. And like the Pennsylvania one, I think is probably the best information. They'll actually tell you percentage of public and private on the creeks. Um, and here's the coolest thing of all. Once you look at an area that you're interested in, you can print your own custom maps. And that came better than that, guys. We have such amazing information at our fingertips. That's it. Chris, thank you for that. Uh, I remember back in 1987, two hatches ago, um, going out to Burke Lake and running a, a John boat. And um, I didn't have any cicada bugs or anything. And I just took a number five Rapala and would just throw it tight to the bushes and be catching these giant carp and giving myself a little Nantucket sleigh ride, just pulling, <laughs> pulling the boat all around. And so, yeah, I absolutely agree. Burke Lake Park is just a, a, an amazing um, uh, little body of water for being in such a heavily populated area. It's just a tremendous, uh, tremendous mm -hmm. fishery on that. Now the boat ramp on the on the side of the lake is actually for fishermen only. Now. That's right. Yeah, it's owned by the one down by the dam. Um, the other thing I would suggest folks may want to take a look at is uh, I on the uh, district angling. I've got a cicada pattern. There's lots of great patterns that'll work, and I think John might find this interesting. Um, I I did the whole bottom orange. I did the front half black. I did small stripes on the abdomen and I caught the adjustable cicada because if you carry a black magic marker you can regulate the amount of orange on the bottom because there's one with a lot of orange one, one with a little and of course there's the all black one so we have that as a tying video and we have the kits in the shop nice nice cool grizzly thank you very much um super informed pleasure you. I really appreciate it um we're going to turn our attention to um, uh, to Butch. Um, uh, where is Butch? Um, I'll let him come up. But but um, Butch uh, and I we go we go way back as well. Um, Butch is part of the Mark Kovac Fishing Services Mafia um, mm -hmm. that uh, he and I uh, both guide for, along with um, Johnny Hayes and um, Travis and um, and and so. Um, Butch is an incredible tire and uh, one of the most creative tires um, I, I know. And uh, he's always trying to crack the code on just about every species. And so it's just uh, so much fun to go out and, and uh, fish with Butch. And so let me just turn it over to Butch now. And, and Butch, you can just uh, go from here talking about tactics and techniques and approaches to uh, fishing. So um, started fly fishing quite a long time ago and was trying all different types of fish and moved to Northern Virginia, met some guys and started, you know, wading around the Potomac and <clears throat> wound up falling in love with this guy right here, the smallmouth bass. And so uh, met a guy by the name of Richard Larkin and he said, you should probably be a guy because you're a little bit more aggressive and you just don't stop fishing. You're kind of crazy. And so anyway, I got, that's when I started working for Mark Kovacs Guide Service. 
And that was in like 95 or 96, something like that. So deep love for these fish. And um, so then I, you know, just once you become a guy, you start, you're in the circle and you start meeting people that fly fish. And one of them is this guy by the name of Richard Wiley and who, who passed a few years back, but he had this relationship with Chuck Kraft. And Chuck Kraft, a lot of people know about him. He is probably uh, one of the, I mean, I, I know that people will talk about the lefty craze of the world, but Chuck Kraft was very innovative and had this, this uh, very high level fishing technique for what we call bug fishing. And, and really we've been practicing for the cicada hatch for years. And, and what I mean by that is that Chuck Kraft on the Shannon or on the James river had this technique of fishing for bug fishing, if you will, um, on the James in the, in the late, you know, like August we're for the dog day cicadas. And so if you've ever spent a day in the boat with Chuck Kraft, it's quite the experience. You know, you, you better be thick skinned and, and ready to be criticized and, and be told what to do. But from that is born this, this technique for fishing for cicadas or for what we call bug fishing, but it's the same thing. And um, a couple things that, that you would need to do to be prepared for this type of fishing uh, one is to know William Rezanek because, or uh, William is Herzenek. He is probably, I think, the descendant of, of uh, Chuck as far as his fly patterns, and he's going to go over that later. And, and me showing you flies, I mean, I, I, I'm throwing his flies. But, but this technique for fly fishing is very, very important. And a couple things. So I, I'll start with, with tackle. And it's a seven or eight weight rod. Um, and it's not a bug taper line. Chuck was very, very passionate about that you threw a weight forward line, a uh, nine foot leader, and, and, you, and, and it, during those days, um, you know, fluorocarbon, you know, back when it, it first started, there wasn't fluorocarbon, but now you can take a standard nylon leader, put a little bit of fluorocarbon on it, and then, you know, pick a bug. Um, but you're going to want to have a good reel because during this particular thing that, that we're about to experience, we're talking about carp that are in excess of 20 pounds in some cases. And so and you're going you're gonna to want to have a, a, a large arbor reel with a good drag system. You're going to want to have a seven foot or eight foot rod. Um, and the, the technique piece of this is a straight line cast angled to the bank, but off the bank. So what, what, Chuck was doing is finding the trees as they overhang and you're throwing to where the branches are close to the water. And I remember him just so, so harping on that. And he goes, if the branches are hanging over the water and a cicada dies, it falls and it falls onto its back. And in most cases it's dead. It's going to be on its shell. And so his patterns would be, um, dictated to that and, and and we can get into you know some of that but those are the the nuances of of bug fishing all year round but the the technique is that you, from a boat is that you would be throwing a straight line cast at one o'clock and you're going to let the bug plop in the water and you don't do anything and i remember him distinctly just browbeating me don't worry it so much. Stop worrying the bug because it is dead and they are eating dead bugs. And I've, I'll never forget that day where the first time I was fishing with them. So the key to this is to be fishing these bugs upstream of these fish. So now this is today's what we've been doing the last, you know, 10 years, this, this style of bug fishing. But now we're going to be fishing for these cicadas falling into the water, you know, a hundred X times the, the amount of bugs in the water. And so this is, you're not going to be 
our, that style of fishing was looking for branches and, and, and blind casting. This is going to be, you are going to find them. And you're going to be looking for slow eddies, bug, bug uh, what we call sud lines. And you're, but you're not going to have a problem finding the fish. Because these carp, and, and mainly this is going to be a carp event, um, you will catch everything in the river will come up and eat these things. But this is primarily going to be a carp event. And I was talking to a colleague of mine, um, and some of you know Jeff Kelby. Um, he was recanting the three weeks um, during the, the last episode of this. And he talked about, you know, out fishing with clients and he saw what he thought snakes. And he wasn't sure what was going on in the water. And it was carp swimming with their dorsal fin out and with their lips out. And it kind of looked like snakes on the water. He rose over. He was like, oh my goodness. And these carp were trying to eat these bugs and they were kind of messing around. And he had a rebel crayfish through that and they ate it. Then the next week he was out, they, got, they wouldn't eat a rebel crayfish. So then he was throwing, then he started throwing, he had to throw flies at them and he couldn't line them, you know, throw a fly and then the line cross over the fish, they would refuse it. So he had to be upstream. So what you're gonna find during this hatch is that in the beginning, it's going to be very fruitful, and then it's going to get technical towards the end of the end of the uh, the this cycle, if you will. Um, and and I, I guess this would be a question for John. You know, what is the the length of time? You know, let's say Northern Virginia Harpers Ferry area. How long will this hatch be? Uh, any any ideas on that, John? Like from a standpoint of the longevity of the hatch and this and how many bugs coming off? Yeah, well, you know, once you get some real weather, <laughs> get out of this cold stuff. So, you know, there's different phases to an emergence, and and probably the fish pick up on that as well. I mean, they're good at learning these kinds of things. The nymph is the nymph phase is the first phase that you see. There are a lot of crawlers or nymphs out there if they fall in the water or anything like that, they're completely helpless, right? They're just gonna plop, that's it. And the fish will get a certain number of those. And that would be the kind of thing that would happen with overhanging branches that cicada nymph steps too far and it's gone. Can't do anything about that. That phase is not gonna last that long if the weather warms up. You know, it's a, it's a week or two week part of the phase. Then the adults are out that lasts on the order of a month. And by the end of that, the cicadas get pretty torn up and decrepit. You know, they don't have any way of repairing damage or healing and they just kind of get beat up over the course of the emergence. So at the end, when they're ready to die, they're just, I mean, they're, they're pathetic. If they fall anywhere, they're just gonna sit there like that until something kills them. And, and, and again, this all depends upon what the weather is like and how the emergence progresses. But I, I have seen emergences. So brood one down in the Shenandoah Valley, uh, a bit further south, um, you know, that ended and it was perfect weather and it was just getting towards the end. The cicadas were in, all torn up and shabby and a big thunderstorm came through and that was it. They were just all dead on the ground the next morning. Uh, and so it can end really suddenly like that, but it generally lasts about a month for the adult phase. So that was one of the other things, you know, talking up to people that were fly fishing pretty heavily for them. They found that as the, as it progressed, the sizes changed. And so one of the, the suggestions I would put out there is walk out if you're waiting or in a boat, but, but look for them and look at the sizes and then look at your fly box and then figure out what is going to match the size and 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 these carp um i don't know how many people out there have fly fish for carp but they are really hard to fish for um they are very particular they have great eyesight they are very spooky and it's very interesting that how when i've talked to a bunch of people that were fishing that during that time is that they would go and they would find and they would look at the sizes and then take the sizes of the of the bugs they were seeing and then look at the flies that they had and they and and i know that you know that's cliche match the hatch but the size of the bugs is going to be a part of it because these fish are eating them every single day and you're going to have to be on your you know you're going to have to be paying attention and one of the last thing that, that jeff told me um, about that because he spent 
three and a half weeks, almost four weeks fishing for them. He said at the end, it was like fishing for a 24 inch brown trout in a spring creek with a size 24 Mitch. That's how technical get. And he said that was the funnest part of it was the fact that it got harder, but it got more challenging because in, in, the, in the beginning, it was it, for him, um, it was you know, it was just, okay, here we go. And then, you know, they were, they were eating and they were fighting them. And, you know, and then it, as they, as the hatch went on, it got harder and a little bit more technical and that's when it became more fun. Um, but I will say um, one of the, you know, a couple of things that, that came from um, the discussions with the different people was that it is a, 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 a fish, a fishery that's going to be challenging on your tackle. You're going to want to have a nine foot, you know, 16 pound, you know, zero X, one X, uh, maybe a little bit of fluorocarbon if you're getting refusals and be, be prepared. But these are, these fish are going to be, you know, I don't know how many people have caught a carp in excess of 10 pounds, but it's, you know, they, they the, some people call it the freshwater bonefish. They are quite the, uh, quite the fighter and they will run and it'll be a lot of fun looking totally, totally uh, just can't wait for it to happen i'm going to be out you know guiding on it and, and fishing for fun as well and i uh just appreciate the opportunity to discuss this i know i'm probably going long so i need to probably pass this over to mark but um if there's any questions um or any you know anything after the chat please hit me up i'm you know I'm, as you know i like to talk and so hit me up and uh you know i will we'll give you share and give you whatever information you might need Butch, one question and um that I think a lot of anglers fishing topwater um, have to address. When you see the take on topwater, are you waiting until you feel that fish on it or are you setting immediately? Or are you waiting until it's pulling? Like talk about that a little bit because I mean, that's that's a real sort of challenge. I mean, with, with carp, especially with a, with a soft mouth and- A great, a that. great, yep, a great question. And um, one of the things that, that if you, this is not a large mouth bass that has a nice hinge jaw where he's got teeth and he can grab and, and real, and then he's aggressive and he takes it. Um, and, and the, the point would be that I would, I would, I would be in a situation with, uh, I would see the take and I would wait, wait for the weight, you know, like that, what we call the wet tennis shoe where you're, you just feel some weight on there and then just very easily lift on them. Um, I would be very careful. I'm sure that, you know, the, the term buck fever would come into play a lot of times, but uh, that's a great question. Um, and I think that there'll be enough opportunities that you can uh, um, get takes and miss them and then try it again. But it would be something where um, I would wait for the fly to disappear and then, then feel the weight and then you would be on them. All right, cool, cool. Thank you for that. I, I know it's just, it, you know how it is sitting in a, in a, in a, in a boat. I mean, the, that question comes up and, um, you know, often, and it often comes up when your guy sitting in the front seat misses two, three fish and after a strike and, um, you know, it's become sort of theological at some point. Um, but anyway, well, Butch, thank you very much. Um, let's just move on to, uh, to, to William. Um, you know, William's been on the, uh, on the scene and, um, you know, a Grizz referenced him and, and, and Butch and, um, you know, he's just been around. He's the owner of um, Eastern Trophies Fly Fishing. Um, you know, just a big apostle of, uh, of Chuck Kraft's, um, you know, bugs. And, and he, he worked with Chuck on, on uh, tying and making videos. And, um, and so it's just a really uh, interesting cat and, and um, you know, has some real insights. And so, um, and, and William guides as well, in addition to teach, but, um, you know, he's just very well known for his book. So William, why don't you just take it from here? Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Appreciate it. We've got a really good turnout. I was just scanning and, uh, scrolling through names and, uh, a lot of, a lot of familiar names. Uh, I got some clients up in New York who are here at this meeting and some from, uh, Pennsylvania. So a lot of familiar names, which is really cool. Um, so I own Eastern Trophies Fly Fishing. Um, I'm a teacher full time, but then pretty much every other minute of the day, it's it's something relating to fly fishing, either bugs being tied up or orders going out or I'm floating down rivers. But 
Uh, I'm honored to uh, be here tonight to talk about this Brood X thing that we have going on. Um, so we're just gonna kind of dive in. So my favorite spot to be is right there in the center of the boat, standing up, trying to spot, you know, fish for, for clients. The interesting thing about this photo is the guy in the front um, is Jeff Kelby, former uh, Potomac River Keeper and former Shenandoah River Keeper, really smart guy in regards to smallmouth bass and carp. Um, anytime you got somebody smart like that in the boat or you can chat with them, you're always pulling some kind of knowledge. And I'm, I'm fortunate that Jeff has, Jeff has shown me a lot over the years. Um, you know, so a lot of knowledge has been pulled from Jeff. So huge props to him. Um, the other guy that I got to mention is Grizzly, um, who spoke earlier. I would not be guiding if it wasn't for Grizzly. He's, he was integral in getting me started years ago. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be, uh, it was my third year back in 04 when we had this Brood X thing happen. So, um, you know, kind of interesting that, you know, I got a lot of knowledge from Grizz and I think it's cool that he's on the panel tonight too. So props, props to you, Grizz. Appreciate all your help over the years. Um, to basically, uh, hang on a minute. I am, uh, I think I'm stuck here. There we go. My, my laptop's lagging a little bit. So if I jump slides, it's because it's just not reacting too fast. The two guys who showed me the most, um, you know, through the years uh, in regards to my, my fly tying career, the guy on the left, Walt Carey, taught me a tremendous amount about just bug production, um, painting bugs, um, just, just certain aspects of basically being in the, um, uh, in the industry and just bug production. Really smart guy, taught me a lot, took me under his wing. Um, we lost him. Uh, earlier this year, uh, which was unfortunate, but um, it, it was it was an honor to know him, and it was even more of an honor for him to pass down so much knowledge to me. I feel very fortunate that I knew Walt. Um, the other gentleman on the right, Chuck Kraft, uh, we lost lost Chuck in 2019. He was another one. I got uh, I, I got chills just just mentioning his name right there. Um, the knowledge that Chuck passed down, not only to myself, but to people um, in the industry, um, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm lucky to have known him. I'm even more lucky to have partnered with him. And we, we were in business for, um, for, for a good amount of time, a little over 10 years. Um, but Chuck, Chuck taught me a lot about fly design, um, developing patterns, uh, what makes a pattern good, what makes a pattern bad, all that kind of stuff, but also uh, in regards to fishing certain patterns and stuff, he's, he, you know, I heard someone mention years ago, it's like he invented the wheel multiple times in regards to fly patterns. Um, you know, I won't talk about all of his patterns, but I'll, I'll talk about a couple as I, as I go through this um, presentation. So the Brood X thing, it's going to be bug life for like three weeks to four weeks. Um, if you have different areas that you can hit, it, it could be a month and a half, especially here in Northern Virginia. It's gonna start probably next week and, and be heavy to a point where fish are gonna react to the bugs being on the water. And then, you know, it'll kind of tail out here, but Western Maryland, PA, New York is gonna kind of groove into the hatch, so to speak. So, you know, you can extend this hatch, which for me, uh, putting people on fish and even fishing it myself, it's it's going to be a good time. Um, so next slide here. Yeah, I just skipped one. Um, in regards to brood hatches, chasing hatches, the statement on top here, you have to work to make it happen is incredibly important. You have to go to where the bugs are. Okay, this is this sounds stupidly simple, but I see a lot of posts on Instagram, Facebook other websites that people kind of think that these hatches are overrated, um, but you gotta put the work in. If you don't put the work in, it's not gonna happen. The bugs aren't just gonna show up in your backyard. You're gonna have to drive sometimes, you're gonna have to put in some work. Second statement, when you go to a location and you get out of your car, if you don't hear them, go somewhere else. It's as, it's as simple as that. If you don't hear them, 
just just keep driving. Go to another spot, check out a different map, check out a different lake or a river or whatever. That's a very good indication that you're just not going to have great fishing if you don't hear them. Um, next one, if you see bugs on the banks, like you get water washing up on shore, if you see a line of cicadas, you're in the right spot. That's a no brainer. Um, the next statement I put was, I originally had, it's gonna be great fishing for carp, but I changed it to epic. And if you can get into it and you can catch it at the right time, especially during the peak, the fishing will be unbelievable. And it's gonna be mostly, I mean, it doesn't have to be a carp thing for you. It could be a trout thing. It could be a bluegill thing. It, it could be a bass thing. But the difference between hooking a smallmouth bass on one of these or a, or a 25 inch trout on one of these compared to a 20 to 40 pound carp. And yes, I said 40 pounds because there's 40 pound fish in rivers and lakes around here. Uh, that's just uncomparable. I would take the carp over trout and smallmouth any day of the week. Um, this is a very good opportunity to break a state record. The state record for Virginia for common carp is 49 pounds, seven ounces or something. You could break it. It's, it's a good shot because everything in a water system is going to be up at the surface. It just brings everybody up to the top. It's like a, it's like a huge dance party. When you're fishing for these things, best thing to be in a boat, obviously, you want to cover water. Don't just stick to one spot. You want to cruise around the lake or cruise around the river. Um, the more water you cover, the more fish you're going to catch. Looking for cruisers is pretty important. Um, you will see dorsal fins at some time. Um, at some point, whether you're fishing for carp, I saw in 04 in regards to trout, where you would look down river and kind of like how Butch just said in regards to the carp, you know, with their dorsal fins up, you will see them literally up at the surface you know, just kind of cruising around. So keep your eyes open. If you're launching flies to these fish, one to three feet out in front of them, you do your splat and you're good to go. <clears throat> this is the targets, uh, big carp. These are, you know, not that big carp. You know, when you're talking about the fish that we have in our river systems, especially in Northern Virginia, PA and Maryland, I mean, we've, we've got bigger fish than what these are in, in the photos. So during the hatch, it's gonna be important that you're aware of certain things. Each fish is different, okay? Fish have different, different personalities, different characters. Um, some fish are gonna eat more, some fish are gonna eat less. You're gonna have fish that just act different than other fish. So you're gonna to have to adjust. Um, each day of the hatch is gonna be different. You might have an epic day tomorrow, but then the day after tomorrow, you might have fish that are gorged. Okay, their stomachs in regards to trout and smallmouth only hold so much. Um, when I fished the hatch and I had, uh, you know, doing floats for the hatch back in 04, we had some epic days, you know, where we're catching, you know, each person 75 fish to 100 fish in a day. And, you know, the next day rolls in and those fish ate so much the day before that they weren't feeding too much on that following day. So you, you, you got to be able to adjust, you got to be able to be patient. Um, you know, don't, don't go in with crazy expectations, but if you get it, 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 you know, it can be some amazing fishing, some of the best of your life. The fish activity is going to equal the volume of them making their sounds in the trees. You know, the more, the, the higher the volume, the more fish activity you're going to have. So I mentioned, you know, you get out of the car, wherever you travel to, to go and chase this hatch. If you get out of the car, and you don't hear anything, that's going to be important. But if you get out of the car and that volume is up, you're probably going to be hitting fish. This last statement, bump it, nose it, and pull it. So when I was doing floats in 04 in Western Maryland, we had the hatch kind of cruise into it being, you know, kind of a very heavy um, kind of all, you know, no, no holds barred, you know, everybody, meaning the fish, every fish in the river system was just coming up and taking literally almost anything that we were splatting out on the water. And then it got to a point where they got smart. And it took about, you know, after the heavy hatch came in, it, it kind of the receding end where it starts to kind of tail out right at the beginning of that tail out is when the fish actually became smart. And it took me about three hours to figure out what the hell the fish were doing. So the clients were drifting flies, 
and they kept missing fish, right? And, you know, fish would come up and, and, and you know, we thought they were takes, but what was happening was the fish, meaning the rainbows and the browns were coming up and they were tracking the pattern and they were literally bumping the bug with a closed mouth to see if it was real. We also saw fish nosing it, meaning, you know, just bumping it with their nose, kind of like the closed mouth thing I just said. The last thing that we saw from especially the bigger fish, 20 inch browns to the 26 inch fish that we were, we were able to boat, they would take one of the legs of the pattern and they would pull it under, they would let go and they would readjust their drift to see if it was a real bug. It was incredibly impressive to see the, the, the fish basically um, developing with the hatch and getting smarter as the hatch happened. So a lot of interesting things will happen when you're fishing it. William, can I jump in and say, remind me to, remind me to talk about that in the Q&A session, because I think I have an idea why they do that. Got it. I will. Um, uh, yep, got it. Um, so some hatch factors from a fish's perspective, how many bugs are there, right? That's kind of a no-brainer. What is the water clarity like? If the water clarity sucks and I can't see the surface, there's going to be a good chance where things are going to be buffered and, you know, it's not going to happen as easily if the water's clear. What's my competition? If I've got buddies who are like in the same run or I got carp that are in the same hold, you know, pool that I'm holding in, you know, it's going to end up being a competition thing. So if you have a higher fish population, if there's going to be competition. Your bug is going to splat out. You might have two, three, four fish coming up. And we had that Western Maryland during the 04 hatch where literally the bug would splat and we would have two to five trout. And I'm talking not small fish, but 16 inch to 24 inch fish coming up and trying to get the bug before the other guys. Um, this next statement is pretty important in, in regards to you fishing. If you've got a lot of boat traffic, meaning power boats, um, your fishing during the hatch is going to stink. Um, I've chased hatches before going down to North Carolina um, where you know, we happened to get there on Memorial Day weekend, and there was so much boat traffic the two days before, it basically shut everything down. So try and avoid crowds, try to avoid, try to avoid power boats. Um, if you have a boat yourself, try to stay off the trolling motor, especially if you're cart fishing, because that will affect the results that you have. The last, uh, last one, how good is your imitation? Right, so you got to really bring the game, especially towards the tail end of the hatch, and also to catch the bigger fish. The bigger fish tend to be smarter in regards to what imitations um, you're throwing at them. So fly patterns. Um, these three statement or these three bullet uh, points right here basically goes back to what Chuck Kraft taught me. Profile is the most important. Second is size. Third is color. But you should have all three of these attributes if you want a killer pattern. Which brings me to my next argument or you know, the choice that you need to make. Foam or cork? Foam is gonna work at the beginning, you know, right when we start to get into that bell curve of the hatch. When you get into the meat of the hatch, you could throw a kitchen spoon at them and you're gonna catch fish, okay? So foam is gonna work great. Cork is also gonna work great. The problems with foam, is it floats high on top of the water and it looks like SpongeBob. It doesn't look like a real bug. Real bugs float halfway on the surface, halfway exposed. Okay, it's just because of the weight of the bug. It's just the way they sit. Um, foam also is lighter than cork. Um, real cicadas are not light. When they hit the water, they're, they're a pretty, uh, pretty dense, you know, insect when they hit the water, they make a pretty substantial splat. So you got two negatives for foam. Yeah, it's a great profile if you get a good pattern like the ultimate cicada, which is pretty much the best foam pattern I've, I've basically come to. But when you have the choice between foam and cork, cork is going to give you more fish, cork will give you bigger fish. Okay, next slide. How do you create this? This is what's going to be happening on the waters where you go and chase this brood hatch. You're going to be having cicadas landing on the water, and they're either going to splat and make rings like this, or if it's a male, they're going to be chirping and making sounds on the water, which create ripples like this, 
or their wings are going to be moving. So there's, there's two ways to kind of emulate what's going on here in this picture. You got the splat, which is basically you making a cast and your bug hits the water. It's like a dinner bell. Okay, it puts vibrations through the water column. And pretty much when that thing hits the surface, the vibrations come through, especially when we have this brood X thing happening, every fish is going to turn and look because it's protein. It's like a, uh, it's like a beautiful French fry. Okay. The other thing that I found very important, especially in, de in developing uh, cork bugs is if you have a flat bottomed bug, you will get more of a belly flop sound on your splat. And I can almost predict when one of my clients is throwing a bug and they make a beautiful tight cast and the loop extends out and the bug splats, you get that kind of teardrop splat and the rings kind of echo out. It's almost like you know when a, when a really good dinner bell, quote unquote, is made compared to a crash landing. You want the splat like a belly flop. So that's why a lot of my bugs are actually flat on the bottom. Chuck's bugs tended to be very round. He did the he did like a round cylindrical type bug, which is great because they were made of cork. But I talked to Chuck about this over the years, and 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 I ended up making a lot of my cicada style patterns in Chuck's Excalibur flatter on the bottom to get that belly flop splat sound, which will end up, you know, with with getting more reactions from fish. The wiggle. The bug splats, you let the ripples dissipate. You could just let the bug drift. That's great. Um, but because we're going to have so many numbers of these bugs on the water, a lot of them are going to be alive when they hit. And you're going to want that kind of shutter move, that wiggle. So to get that wiggle, you do a very, very slow, short strip, you know, very slow, about two inches long. And you lift your rod just a little bit at the same time and shake your hand. You can do it with your wrist. You can do it with your forearm. But what that does is it moves the bug literally an inch to two inches. Very little, but it puts a little wake to the bug. But at the same time, that wiggle will shutter the legs and make them wiggle. And when you do this movement with bugs, especially these cork bugs, the results are unbelievable. You will call them up. You will see shadows come up. You will get takes. It's a beautiful thing. So Chuck's Excalibur, um, this is one of his, uh, basically his dog day cicada kind of styles. Um, I do my paint schemes a little bit different than what Chuck used to do. I, I have basically leg impressions here at the front of the bug. And then you do these striations here for the timbal on the back. His popper tail finishes off the bug at the end, which basically emulates the wings that come back to a V. And it gives you a perfect profile of the cicada. When you look at these Excaliburs floating on the water and you're, you know, you're looking under the bug straight up at the sky, I mean, they look exactly like either a dog day cicada or these brood X guys, okay? Um, these legs that are orange on this bug, I basically call them trigger legs because they're medium round rubber legs and they shake a little bit easier compared to the large rubber legs here that act more like wings. So by doing that little wiggle that I just talked about, these trigger legs, the thinner ones, will wiggle a little bit easier and it just gives it, it gives a different look. It gives a contrast to the bug, which I think gives you a lot of strikes. This yellow spot on the front is basically an indicator stripe. Um, on Chuck's bugs, when he used to make his years ago, he would do the entire top of the fly a lighter color so that you could see it. But the problem that I found with doing the entire bug a light color on top is if your bug was backwards or tangled, you didn't know. So you might miss a hook set because the bug was tangled and backwards. By doing the indicator stripe on the front, you know if your bug is facing you, you know if it's perfectly, you know, you're getting a perfect drift and it's not tangled. So that's one way that I kind of improved on, on Chuck's design over the years. This is a different kind of style of Excalibur. Um, same style bug as in the previous slide. The only difference is you have these clawdad tail, this clawdad tail coming out of the back of the bug. It gives you a, a more true imitation of the wings of the bug as they go to the back of a cicada. Um, you're looking at rust color and black 
orange and black if you want to really go you know intense um, you can have legs black orange i think both are going to work really well but on the bottom of these bugs um, it's basically just a rust colored nail polish that i do to the do the designs these well are, just, just real quick <clears throat> uh, on the fly sometimes when you're throwing um the excalibur bugs they they don't always land um you know with with the stripe side down do you if they land upside down are you trying to like men to turn them over or do you just simply like do you, do you just fish that out on so so when, when a bug doesn't turn over it usually shows that you didn't have a tight loop on your cast right um i also weight my bugs on the bottom so that even if they do land upside down, they should roll on them by themselves. If they don't, you can do like a short twitch and it'll roll over. Um, it, it's actually interesting over the years fishing, uh, fishing these bugs, you know, we, we have had bugs land upside down, but then you do that twitch to roll them over and then a big fish will come up. And it, I don't know what it is. It's almost like a, a you know, a bug landed and rolled over. But we, we've had some really big fish, you know, talk, talking mostly smallmouth now, um, when the bug landed upside down, but then rolls over. But, um, you know, by, by landing upside down, it's usually that you don't have a tight loop on your cast. Mm -hmm. It's kind of an indicator. Um, and, and, you know, I'll constantly say to my clients, you know, look for yellow, look for yellow. And if your bug doesn't, you know, land with yellow up it's you know you got to twitch it and usually a twitch or a short strip will will roll them over got it. okay um these are some matches here to the uh brood x cicadas here um i actually sent these bugs to uh jeff kelby and then he sent me this photo with basically the three species in this brood x and you know you can see that the bugs match it pretty well both the size profile um and color Big thing here, trust the bug, okay? No matter what pattern you're fishing, trust what it's gonna do. Um, you know, give it some time when, it's, when it lands out on the water, but don't rush it. You know, you don't wanna pop these flies. Um, popping will push big fish away. You wanna, you wanna be patient. Um, Chuck Craft's Boga Bug, another very good topwater imitation that's gonna match these cicadas. Uh, these are two cicada versions um, that I, uh, you know, that I'm showing you here. The interesting thing about these two pictures, it's the same bug, but just different legs. So you can change these legs out to basically match what's going on, right? So if you fish this first one on the left, that's got the white wings and then, you know, the trigger legs that are orange. If you're getting refusals from this guy, all you got to do is take about three minutes you know, take a needle with some legs that you might keep in a leg kit in your boat or whatever and change out the legs. And it might be the result of you, you know, having refusals first, but then putting fish in the boat. So with these bugs, both the Excaliburs and the Boga bugs, you can interchange the legs. Or after your bug fishes for a season and you've caught 200 fish, like easily these bugs can last for 200 fish, Bug, uh, Chuck and I would call it bug rehab, where you would just pull the old legs out and put new legs in, and it's like getting a new set of tires on your car. But I've got I've got bugs in my uh, in my boat box that are you know ten years old, and they've got five hundred fish on them. I mean these these bugs will last for a long time. They're not your typical foam bugs. They're not deer hair bugs. These these things are built like tanks. Hey William, okay. um, yeah. just. If, if you want to finish up in the next couple of minutes, that'd be awesome. So we could leave some time for questions because I know they, they have a bunch in the chat. I'll roll, I'll roll quick. Um, these, this style here are uh, Boogle Bugs, just painted over black. And then you put the, uh, put the paint scheme of the Brood X on it. And then you got the red eyes, which are just uh, pin beads or uh, bald pins for, uh, you know, sewing and stuff. You just clip those off and stick them in with some Gorilla Glue. Works really well. The ultimate cicada is the best foam pattern I have ever fished chasing broods. Um, it's got the profile, it's got a flat bottom for a good splat. They're very durable. Um, about 2000 of these went out last week and about 3000 have gone out since January. Uh, we just got restocked. So if you do need cicada patterns, we've got them. Um, and we've got uh, special pricing on dozens. This is our Eastern Trophy cicada, very similar. Um, a little bit more simple uh, indicator popper tails on top 
red beads for uh, the eyes. Those 3D type eyes are very important. Subsurface stuff, when the hatch starts to tail out, subsurface is going to be key for you to still catch good fish. Just think woolly bugger, Pat's rubber legs, Bitch Creek nymph, just simple patterns, black and orange with some orange legs, you'll get the trip, you know, you'll get the deal done. Right here on this screen, it just talks about gear. The most important thing in regards to this slide, 16 pound. Don't go less than 16 pound. We have broke, broken big fish off on, 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 on 1X and 2X. I will never go back to 1X and 2X. These fish are not going to be leader shy, okay? There's too many, you know, too many French fries on the water for them to be picky, right? And even at the tail end of the hatch, even when we're doing regular bug fishing in the fall for smallmouth, last year I went to 16 pound test because we broke off huge fish on takes and 16 pound test will not let you down. Hook sets, the most important. Um, that's one reason why we're using 16 pound is because I can say to the client, hook them like you're hooking a striper. And it, it puts the seal, it, you know, it puts the seal on the envelope. Um, that's the most important thing in regards to fishing for big fish. That's where I see most of the breakdowns is on the hook set. So 16 pound comes in. Spin fishermen, jitterbugs, paint the bottom of, paint the bottom of them like uh, cicadas, do some red eyes. Buzz baits are going to be key for spin fishermen. Yes, it's, it's zipping across the water, but they're going to key in on it because of the color, because of what's going on on the surface. With buzz baits, if you rough up the bearing and the bottom of the blade, it'll squeak. Okay, I call doctoring the I call it doctoring a buzz bait. Basically, if you do this, the squeak will trigger more strikes, especially from smallmouth. The head and baby torpedo and the tiny torpedo, just paint the bottom just like a cicada. Stick some pin eyes on these guys, and you will catch fish on tiny torpedoes. It's a great bait to throw for spin fishermen. We've got thousands in stock. EasternTrophies.com is where you can find everything, and I'm done. Great, thank you. William, um, I want to I want to jump in really quickly and go back to that business because it sounds to me like what your fish are doing is learning, and I think I know I think I know what they're learning. So when we look at periodical cicada emergences, the birds learn really fast not to chase males, and the reason is that when you look at uh, when you look at the cicadas, actually we could do that. So we'll go over here to the website. We'll look at the behavior. When you look at the male, the male's abdomen's hollow. So a male is mostly just a big bag of air and it's, it's not worth eating. And more, moreover, it's gonna float and it's gonna sit on the water in a different way from a female cicada. What happens with the birds is they learn, don't chase a cicada that makes a sound because only the males make a sound. And they learn that really quick. It sounds to me like what the fish are learning is don't chase a cicada don't bother with a cicada that floats right up there on the surface so when you see them pulling them under and watching them bob up they're testing whether that thing is a male or a female for those of you who are making uh various patterns in you know bear if you're looking at that we go over here and uh we'll just pull up the species the cassini species tend to be in river bottoms and they're the ones that are dark it's not an absolute rule they're the ones that only have the orange legs and not the orange stripes. Uh, you can tell what you got by what they sound like. So the sounds tell you what the species are. But the most important thing here is that the females and the males have a different profile. They look different from underneath. And the females are pointy on the end and the males are not. So these aren't the world's greatest photographs, but you can see here the male has an abdomen that's just kind of bulbous and rounded at the end. And that's right in there. And then the female has an abdomen that comes right like the, the prow of a little boat to a sharp point. And that's probably completely obvious from underneath to a fish. So it sounds to me like what they're doing is very fairly quickly learning that the males are not worth eating because there's just nothing there. I love it. So love it, love that's, it. That's something you guys are gonna have to test uh, this season out there. See, you know, try a couple of different things and see if it seems like the fish are learning to steer away from the male cicadas because they're just empty. Good stuff, good stuff. Look, um, I think it's also fish adapting to fishermen. Um, I had a encounter somewhat like what William's talking about up on the Little Lehigh, uh, a famous tough to catch fish 
uh, Spring Creek up in PA, up by Allentown. And this was hopper season. And what they were doing was actually, and I actually threw live hoppers in to figure this out. Um, they were coming up and grabbing just the tail end of the hopper, pulling it under, letting go. And if it came up too quick, like my flies would, they'd turn away. So I was trimming my fly to get almost everything off of it. And they would finally pull my fly under, let it go. And as it slow, was slower, because I trimmed off all the, most of the foam, they would eat it. So they adapt to us on pressured water. So as more people and more fish see the cicadas, people fishing the cicadas, they're definitely going to adapt. And, and uh, by the way, Butch, William, great information for folks, golden. The, the hopper yeah. stuff, by the way, sounds like it's the same. It's, you know, if you're a fish or a bird or whatever, you want to eat a female insect because they're going to be the ones full of eggs and they're going to be mm -hmm. the ones that are kind of waterlogged. They're going to be the ones that really splat. They're kind of dense, heavy. They're the thing when you're driving down the highway and they hit the windshield, it just goes <laughs> like that. And, you know, I did, no wiping in the world is going to get rid of that. That's what the birds and I'm, uh, it sounds like the fish are learning to, to select because the other ones just aren't worth it. And hoppers work the same way. Good yeah, stuff. thank you. Emily, you wanna, you wanna... there, there's a, a long list of questions. You want to just try to cycle through as many as we can? I'll, I'll let you yeah. do that. Yeah, sure. I'll, I'll go through questions. So just, just right before, I wouldn't be a very good development person if I didn't say, of course, you know, thank you guys for um, for uh, joining the panel and, and speaking on behalf of this. I know a lot of people are really interested in this, um, but of course, fishing wouldn't be possible without clean rivers. So um, if you aren't already, consider becoming a member of Potomac Riverkeeper Network. Um, organization does a lot of good work to, you know, clean up our rivers. Uh, enforce uh, enforce clean water rules and you know we have a lot of fun in the rivers too so come out we have river palooza events that are just starting so if you want to get out in the river and do some do some rafting do some pad paddling um we have our first bird watching event on the 21st and there's just a couple spots left too for that one so if you'd like to join um, on the shenandoah on the shenandoah yes of course uh if you'd like to join check it out on our website um so okay I will uh, get to questions now. There was just a couple that were submitted right before um, their email. So I'm gonna ask those first. So first one, I saw a lot of cicada nymphs emerge last night and this morning. Many had not fully molted. I assume they got interrupted by the cool temperatures overnight. Will these cicadas resume and complete their molting today as the temperature rises or are they goners? <laughs> a lot of them are gonna be goners. <laughs> when they're molting, they they start a process that is irreversible uh that so th these are animals where the skeletons on the outside they have to shed their skeleton every time they grow or change that's a bizarre way of living but that's what they do the chemical processes involved in hardening up start when they're molting and they it's like a timer has started and then they have to get out of their old skin inflate their bodies and get that all done before that hardening process occurs. If they've started that hardening process when they get shut down by the cold, they're done. And there's nothing that can be done to preserve them. There are sort of lesser versions of that failure that you'll see. So you'll see a lot of cicadas around with crumpled wings and such like that. They got mostly out. They just didn't get the wings all the way out before they hardened up. And so you'll see, you know, every, every variation of this one, one normal wing, one crumpled up wing, you'll see everything out there. It, it's really the most dangerous time for an insect is the molting process because it's helpless and there's so much that can go wrong. <laughs> Thank you, John. Um, so second question, does the high volume of, of food reduce the catch rate for smallmouth because of the abundance of food? But you wanna jump in on that? So it's going to be an opportunity for all the fish. Um, you know, will um, carp out, you know, uh, chase down these bugs before the smallmouth can get to them? Yeah, there would be probably an equal opportunity for all these fish. Um, I think that you'll find that the carp will probably key on them pretty well. Um, I think that uh, you're just going to have to watch the water and and uh, and look. You might be able to actually target 
fish. And I think that, you know, probably William probably say the same thing is that, you know, if you're watching a, uh, if you're drifting down and covering water, you'll be able to see smallmouth versus the carp. It'll be pretty easy to identify them. And then you can go ahead and, and, uh, and, you know, select those fish that you want to fish to. Cool. Um, so next question. So this person is interested in coloration. Um, so when, when tying, what colors are important for the fly? Well, I think William hit that earlier and I'll let him finish, but you know, it was definitely size profile and color are definitely going to be, these things are black, you know, they're pretty dark. Yeah, I think, I, I think it's going to be, so each, each fish is going to be different, right? They're going to be targeting the bugs and, you know, cruising around and stuff. If you stick with either a very rust colored base or a black base, and do either black lines or orange lines, you know, depending on what base color you have, I think you're gonna be spot on. Um, you know, as you get towards the tail end of the hatch, I think that's when everything's really gonna come down to it is if fish are keying in on the females and, you know, the fish are gonna be smarter. I think that's where it's gonna come down to how good is your pattern. And that's, that's why over the years I've kind of, basically whittled it down to the ultimate cicada as my foam pattern. And then Chuck's Excalibur and Boga bugs, you know, those cork bugs, just outfishing the rest. At the beginning of the hatch, it's going to be anything. It'll be crankbaits. It'll be buzzbaits. Anything that looks rust and black, boom, they're going to hit it, especially once they're really keyed in on it. And they've got a couple of these things in their mouth and their stomach. Um, you know, so color wise, I think it's going to be like a dark rust, black, um, is, is going to, is going to be good. I would, I would add in there, you know, there's lots of different kinds of blacks and lots of different kinds of, of ways that you can make black appear. This is the greasy black. They're really greasy. And so anything you could do to make it look or, or feel greasy black is probably going to be better than some sort of a flat black or something of that nature. Because when you hold these, these are, these are the kind of insects that make wax and grease and they're just covered in this stuff. So, so John, greasy is actually a fly fishing term describing <laughs> water that just yeah. looks really good, like greasy well, water. <laughs> these are greasy bugs. <laughs> I could make a suggestion that you might want to take your landing net and just scoop some up and do some observations while you're on the water. Take your time, try and figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. My take, um, okay. guys, is my take real quick is. Uh, Let's not give the fish too much credit at this point. <laughs> a nice dark profile will do it most of the time. I think fly um, tires make it more complex sometimes than it needs to be. Okay, great. Um, I think we have a couple of questions for John. So um, what would cause a brood Brothers to go extinct? Um, what makes them go extinct? Well, um, the all the usual stuff. Um, so habitat destruction, you know, you come plow down the forest, that's it. They're gone. Uh, one of the other interesting things uh, is that there uh, is certainly climate change is a problem for them. It's not necessarily in the way you would think. Um, there is a lag because of their long life cycles and how they can respond to environmental conditions. And so that's going to make them vulnerable to, to things that change fast. And one of the places actually what we've seen extinctions uh, is on the northern edge. So the northern boundary, uh, we had a brood here in Connecticut that went extinct. They're going extinct in other places. That, and that is probably reflecting conditions that were 200 years ago. That's how long it's taken to shake out of the system. Um, what's going to happen now, you know, with warming and all that, that's probably not going to be great for them because it's going to change all the forests. Anything that lives in the forest is going to be affected by that. So they get, they get driven extinct, extinct by any number of things. I think the key thing to keep in mind is that they have to have high population densities. You start to push those densities down, that's gonna send them into an extinction spiral, they're done. They're like passenger pigeons in that respect. Okay, and are there several species in the same brood? Oh yes, brood 10, you're gonna find all three species, Septendecim cassini and Septendecula. Um, and and I think it was Bear does... pointed out, they, they differ in the uh, abdomen coloration and the nature of the stripes on the underside. 
And how much does the geographic distribution of a brood shift from generation to generation? How far could a cicada travel in its lifetime? So those are two slightly different questions. Uh, a cicada can fly. They're not eager flyers because they tend to like to stick to their trees where the choruses are, but we've found them. And this is this is where we, where we get this figure. We found them about a mile out into a cornfield in Illinois. So, you know, they flew a mile because they didn't start out in the cornfield. I don't think that's their preference. When we look at the brood boundaries, um, we found the boundary of brood six shifted in North Carolina by up to two kilometers, but it was much smaller. So about a mile or so over the course of one generation. That's one of the questions we're going after with brood 10 because I was out there in 2004 with the GPS unit. We're gonna go and see if it's any different. So this person was asking about, so the fungus infection that you had talked about, is it severe enough that it could affect the survival of the species? And what happens if my dog eats a fungus, fungus infected? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the question of the hour. So um, the, the fungus, I mean, I have seen some places where it was shocking, the density, and just the, it smelled like a roadkill because the dead cicadas on the ground due to this. Uh, other places, I mean, you can go a whole year and not find any fungus. So it's weirdly patchy and we don't really understand a lot about it. As far as your dog eating it goes, I think at this stage, I think I'd stay away from that, given that these contain psilocybins and other things. Your dog could end up having a very, very strange day after eating one of those cicadas. Um, and, you know, dogs will gorge themselves on, on the cicadas normally, and that's also something you want to watch about. I mean, it is a dog. It's got a stomach that's basically made of cast iron, but there are limits. And, you know, dogs are not very good about self-regulating what they eat. And if they go and eat an awful lot of these things, generally it ends really badly one way or the other. <laughs> And it's just sort of better to encourage Fido or even cats do this, maybe maybe not overindulge and stay away from the fungus ones. Um, okay, I think we'll move down a little bit. So this person was curious about adding weight to foam bugs uh, as in how, or is it important? So you, you can definitely add weight to foam bugs. It obviously increases the splat. Um, it'll also, uh, bring the foam pattern down a little bit in the in the film so it will make a difference and I have done that in in some of the foam patterns that I, I personally fish or have clients fish um, you know when you when you have foam compared to cork cork is going to outfish it it's going to outlast it yes those bugs take longer to make if you make your own or they're more expensive but um, you know foam foam will work and, and yes you can wait foam bugs on the inside, just wrap lead around the shank and boom, put your foam body over top or tie it up, uh, tie it on over top or wrap the foam around it and you, you'll get a better splat. Pat, uh, is there a time of day that's best to fish cicadas? Fish cicada, is, temperature, is it temperature dependent? My, my yeah, my experience is uh, the meat of the day, so to speak. So. Um, if you got a warm day and it's warming up quick, you're going to hear them, in, you know, volume is going to go up on the trees and you're going to start to see, you know, the, the, the fish reacting to it because more cicadas are active. There's going to be more dropping on the water or landing on the water. So in my experience, especially during 04, um, our best fishing was from about 10 o'clock in the morning once the sun got up to about five or six at night. And then it kind of chilled out especially because I think a lot of the fish were just gorged by the end of the day. So, so my experience is the meat of the day, 10 to six, 10 to five is gonna be the go-to go time. <clears throat> Got it. Um, and then the, cicadas the, aren't, uh, the, the cicadas aren't gonna be active if it's below 60 degrees Fahrenheit or if it's you know rainy or horrible or anything like that. Same thing, um, 2008 up in PA. Uh, just go to the diner, get your breakfast, get on the water after breakfast. Yeah. Matter of fact, I was tying flies in the diner. I, I tipped the waitress a couple. <laughs> <laughs> Jasper. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, okay, I'll just ask, we'll just do one more question since we're, we're running out of time here. Um, does milky spore used to kill Japanese beetle grubs impact cicada larvae? Very specific. 
Um, probably, but you know what that's. So one of the top questions we get at our website is how do I kill them? And uh, the answer that we give people is don't. Um, that's probably not a great idea. These are species that have been a part of our forests uh, for longer than there've been human beings uh, here in North America. And it's a natural part of the forest and you start disrupting the ecosystem like that, you really don't know what the results are gonna be. We do know they move nutrients around we know that a good cicada emergence is a sign of a healthy forest. Just leave, let them do their thing and don't, don't try to er eradicate them or anything like that. And we always get asked that and we always say the same thing. You, know, you don't really want to do that. All right. Um, so I think to be respectful of everyone's time, we're going to end it there. Um, Mark, did you have anything you wanted to say before? Yeah, um, thank you all for coming and uh, for participating in this. It's been very interesting, very informative, very fun. Um, and also to the to the speakers, to John and Grizz and, and, and William and, and Butch, um, much appreciated. And um, and also to the, to the larger group, Potomac River Keeper Network. We are a non-governmental organization. Some of you out there may be familiar with us. Some of you may not be. Um, but uh, we exist to um, ensure and protect and preserve the Potomac River and the Shenandoah River. And we also promote river access and recreation. That's the fun part of the job. That's what we're doing right now. But, but we also go full bore on um, protecting the river. And we can't do it without people like you. And um, if these kinds of things interest you, you should consider joining us and um, fighting, the, fighting the good fight for the cause. So thank you all for coming and um, have a good night. And Thanks see you everyone. on the water. Thank you. Have a great night, everyone. Bye.